Thank you indeed, Rebecca. Okay, moving back to the opposition. Speaking second in opposition is Professor Judy Weissman. Shh, order please, thank you. Professor Weissman is a Professor Emeritus of Sociology at the London School of Economics and Principal Investigator on the Women in Data Science and Artificial Intelligence Project at the Alan Turing Institute. Her books include Technofeminism and Press for Time, The Acceleration of Life in Digital Capitalism. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Professor Weissman, you have the <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I feel like I should actually say I'm Judy Wiseman from, from um, you know, Darwin and St. John's, as everyone else is introducing themselves. Um, I had a wonderful time here, so I'm delighted um, to be back in Cambridge. I absolutely um, do not believe that AI is an existential threat. In fact, I, I think the very framing of the issue in these terms is very unhelpful because I think it really... Um, is not a good way of understanding the relationship between AI and society. And in fact, it seems to me that it's really a cover for enormous commercial interests that are at stake that we should confront. <clears throat> in Australian politics, we call this the dead cat strategy. The strategy of deliberately diverting attention away from pressing problems by throwing a dead cat on the table and saying, look over there, mate, don't look at anything else, look over there. In the current debate, it seems to me, in the current debate about AI, existential threat is serving as the dead cat. I'm a sociologist of technology and I've spent uh, most of my career studying the impact of technology on society. And I do that by looking at the real world material impacts of technology on society. And I was invited here today to bring a feminist perspective uh, to the debate and I'm very glad to be invited to do that and that's what I'm going to do. I don't think AI is an existential threat, but I do think that AI may well replicate old gender stereotypes, old gender roles, and may embed gender inequity rather than solving these problems. <clears throat> to put it simply, the technical systems may be new, but the patriarchy still have their hands on the hardware and the software. Um, and this is, uh, to me, the threat that we should be confronting and discussing. So let me just make three points about the gender relations of artificial intelligence. Firstly, AI will not deliver gender equality at work. If you ask ChatGPT, and forgive me, but I will talk a little bit about ChatGPT, if you ask ChatGPT about the implications of the use of AI for gender equality, um, it says that it will eliminate human bias because it programs with no assumptions about gender or other personal characteristics. And goes on to say that it can help to level the playing field for women in the workplace. Now these claims are simply not true and let's take them in turn. We're constantly told that AI will produce a lot of very well-paid, high-skilled jobs. And that is a wonderful thing. Jobs in data science, jobs in computer science, uh, jobs in machine learning. But our group at the Alan Turing Institute has been looking into these jobs. And what we found is old patterns of discrimination in STEM subjects are being reproduced in these new fields. Whether it's, uh, whether if you look at, um, you know, Facebook and Google and these big companies and how women, how many women are actually uh, doing the AI in these companies, it's around 15%. If you look at world uh, leading conferences in machine learning, if you were to go to one of these conferences, you would find that 88% of the attendants are men. So these areas are still highly skewed by gender. And it's not that women can't do computer science. I don't have to remind this audience, so close to Bletchley Park, about how central women were to computing after the Second World War, were always central. They were actually known as the programmers in the early days and are now being excluded um, from these great new forms of work. 
So AI might be, revolution, might be a revolutionary technology in some ways, but it's certainly not delivering gender equality. Rather, it's still dominated by male engineers and leaders who design our machines, and I would argue, actually, in ways that are appropriate for themselves. And I'll come back uh, to this point in a moment. Secondly, the claim, let me look at the claim, that AI will eliminate human social bias. That claim also isn't true. And we shouldn't be surprised about this. We shouldn't be surprised that machine learning algorithms, like all previous technologies, and that's what I want to stress, like all previous technologies, bear the imprint of their designers and the culture in which uh, they're designed. The idea that technology is somehow a neutral, uh, unbiased, autonomous driver really has been supplanted, I'd say, in the last you know, 20 years or so by the idea, by the recognition, really, the widespread recognition, and you know, we've done a lot of work to get here, I should say, in science and technology studies, that we now very much think of technologies as always the result of human choices and human values, that technologies always reflect the culture that produces them. Um, you couldn't just wait a moment, could you? Just let me, okay, <laughs> sorry, I'm just I'm making a related point here. Um, I just want to give some examples, whether it's Airbnb discriminating against guests with African-American names, Google showing advertisements for well-paid jobs more to men than to women, or passport checkers working less effectively with darker skins. Histories of discrimination live on in these technologies and become a part of the logic of algorithmic systems. You only have to think of something like Wikipedia, which we've worked on for years, that you know, over-represents male scientists, under-represents women um, scientists. This is the sort of data that AI is trained on. So we shouldn't be surprised that these kinds of biases are being reproduced um, in these new systems. So a big issue in the here and now, and I think we should focus on the here and now rather than this um, putative uh, future, is the way AI systems like chatbots exhibit gender stereotypes. I mean, I have to say in our last report, we found it very hard even to find an image of AI that wasn't blue, actually. It was a male colleague of mine who pointed this out to me. And, you know, is there something about machine intelligence that always, if you look at the images that you get, they're always these machinic images and colour. The colour is blue. I mean, I'm not arguing for pink, but, you know, why does it have to be blue? Yes, all right, yes. Yes, yes, hang on, so, yes. Basically, I agree with everything that you said, but wouldn't you agree that the same way today there are biases in these models, in the future there will remain biases that we didn't intend to be there? I, I believe that OpenAI didn't intend to have racist stereotypes in their models. They worked very hard to eliminate them, but they didn't succeed. So wouldn't it mean that in the future there will still be unintended features of these models? Furthermore, wouldn't you say that like, um, we should address both of these problems, such as, uh, just, just like with global warming, um, we are worried about current risks of global warming, but also future risks, risks of global warming. So I think we can coexist here. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't I agree? I, I mean, I, I think always the issue that is raised um, when feminists make these points is whether the bias is conscious or unconscious. I think both of those things are the case, right? I'm not arguing that people, th you know, that when people build stairs and no lifts, that they are trying consciously to affect women, with, you know, to make life harder for disabled people, that they're trying to make life harder uh, for parents with prams. I'm not saying that at all. I'm talking about the way biases come into designs because designs reflect the people who design them. I mean, what I was going to what I was exactly going to go on to say um, is that we must acknowledge that technical systems are only as good as the engineers and the computer scientists who design them and the quality of data that's fed into them. I mean, it's a very big debate about to what extent you can solve these problems technically by, um, you know, technically ad adjusting the algorithms or whether the problem is much deeper. And it seems to me it's, it's a societal structural problem, that it is a deeper problem. But this is a much debated 
sort of issue that we can we can come back to. Ah, and you see, this has taken up my time. Is this the? <laughs> ah, my goodness. Um, Okay, the lack of diversity, um, I would argue, and this is how I'm answering you, I think very much skews the technology we get and that there really is a feedback loop whereby the lack of women in high tech results in this gender bias. Um, I w there's lots of other things I was going to talk about, but maybe I'll sort of skip them and come on to my third point if you're serious about the time. Okay, um, all right. My third point was that I really think we need to pause for a moment and consider why this is the question of the day. Why are we even discussing this issue of AI being an existential threat? I mean, I think it's worth noting that this fear is based on a form of self-flattery, that we're going to produce such amazing machines that you know, are going to be so awesome that there'll be a problem for us. But I also think, actually, it's a lot about the value we as a society put on technology as the solution to social problems. That seems to me really kind of deep-seated here. And I think it's part of the rhetoric of Silicon Valley. You know, with these visions of the future, this overblown rhetoric about these amazing, you know, technologies, you know, the claim all the time that they're going to be super intelligent, um, superhuman. It seems to me, you know, the software is incredibly impressive. There's amazing things that are being done, but sentient, I don't think so. And I think what's important to say is that I think these visions that we are getting now from these tech people from Silicon Valley actually operate in very uh, clear ways for these companies as a way to grab resources and to influence um, government policy. And I really think we should be uh, very cognizant of that, that it's been a great marketing campaign in terms of the amount of venture capital uh, that is going on to these areas. If I may just conclude, just um, very quickly, what I worry about is not about super in intelligent machines. What I do worry about is a very small number of companies having a phenomenal amount of power to decide what kind of technologies we're going to get, what technologies are on offer, what technologies we can um, choose from. You know, they're not only capturing our data, these companies, they're actually capturing our vision of what a good and fair society can be. So, is AI an existential threat? I don't think so. I think this underlying fear and its binary framing is so familiar, so repetitive, so easy that it might as well be automated as far as I'm concerned. I think there are much not knottier questions that we have to look at and perhaps we should try to be more critical, more original, more, dare I say, ambitiously human with how we interrogate AI. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.